from the JAMA Network. This is JAMA Neurology Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Neurology. My name is Dr. Cynthia Armand, Associate Professor of Neurology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Montefiore Medical Center. Today, we are talking about dementia risk in focal epilepsy. Joining me is Dr. Zin Yu Tai. Dr. Tai is a clinical academic fellow in cognitive neurology and neurology specialist registrar at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Dr. Tai, welcome to the podcast today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Dr. Tai, I want to start this conversation by asking you a question relevant to the study. Is epilepsy in general a risk factor for dementia? What was known prior to this study that you engaged in with your colleagues? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And in short, the answer is yes, it is a risk factor. But really, this has been something that's been sort of brewing over the last several years or decades. There's this increasing concern of cognitive difficulties, as well as dementia risk in people with epilepsy as they grow older. And obviously, this has major impact on quality of life. And I think once thought to be a disorder of discrete seizures and a return to cognitive baseline in between these seizures, there's more and more known about an ongoing cognitive issue and increased dementia risk. It's just that we don't know too much about it as of yet. Right. Now, pathophysiologically, does it make sense? I mean, what mechanisms are involved? Yeah, that's another great question. And, (laughs) you know, I think we don't quite know the answer to that. And that's a real key interest of my research. Now, I'm sure we'll get to this. The current study that we're talking about doesn't quite get into pathomechanisms, but there are a few links out there in the literature. And for example, in the past, I've looked at the presence of hyperphosphorylated tau in people with epilepsy and shown that in drug-resistant temporal lobe epilepsy, there is a very high burden of tau. And that actually corresponds to long-term cognitive outcomes. And I'm happy to expand on that. And I think that's one potential mechanistic link And the other link is this presence of cardiovascular risk and some cardiovascular mechanism going on. And I think that's a really intriguing line of thought, which we did try to get at with this study. Right. Now, in your study, you specifically are looking into focal epilepsy, dementia risk, and the contribution of cardiovascular risk factors with comparison to other neurologic diseases. Tell us more about this setup, your objectives, your hypothesis. Yeah, so we looked at data from a population cohort called the UK Biobank, which is a population-based cohort in the UK, and it's a really terrific resource. It's got information from over half a million individuals aged between 38 and 72 years of age, and they've collected a whole host of data. So health data, medical measurements, things like blood pressure, BMI, they've done blood tests on these individuals, including genetics, as well as neuroimaging in a sub-cohort of, I think, around 60,000 individuals. So these are people who have gone for brain scans and also imaging of their liver and such. And we wanted to look at two main things. Firstly, is there an associated cognitive impairment or worse performance on cognitive measures in people with epilepsy, focal epilepsy, compared to healthy controls? And also to compare this with individuals who have had a previous history of stroke or migraine. And this was really made possible by this data set for a couple of reasons. It's a rich amount of data collected, and they've also got longitudinal follow-up of the hospital records. So for example, if someone's entered into the study in 2008, and we know because of hospital follow-up whether they've developed a diagnosis of dementia, let's say 10 years down the line. Um, So this was really useful because it allowed us to model the risk of developing dementia using survival analyses techniques. Some of your listeners may have heard of Cox proportional hazard modeling. So essentially, you get a number which suggests whether a group is at increased risk of developing a condition compared to a baseline group, and it takes time to disease into account. Is there a particular reason why you picked comparators of migraine and stroke? Yeah, so initially it started off being looking at epilepsy compared to controls, 
But I thought it would be really interesting to compare across neurological conditions, stroke and migraine. Firstly, because I think we do know that there is going to be some cognitive impact of having epilepsy, but we wanted to put it into context. And we thought, what better way than to look at other conditions, um, other neurological conditions? And stroke is very useful because stroke, as you may know, is very closely related to vascular dementia. So it's a very proximal risk factor to developing a vascular type dementia. And so we thought that would be really good to look at. And then migraine was kind of thrown in there as a, a positive control which is useful. We may talk a, a bit about that later. And from a hypothesis point of view, what we thought we'd find was that yes, epilepsy has an effect. It increases your dementia risk more than controls and more than migraine, but probably not as much as stroke, which is so closely related to vascular dementia. Yeah, I'd just like to add that as a headache specialist, I like that you threw in migraine because it's it's a popular question. We do a lot of neuroimaging. Uh, there's question of white matter hyperintensities. What are those doing? And I bring that up because this is something that you looked at in your study in terms of dementia risk and focal epilepsy, comparing those three neurologic diseases. You looked at cardiovascular risk factors. What were the parameters for cardiovascular risk factors that you used in order to follow? Yeah, so we stratified our cohort into people with low, moderate, or high cardiovascular risk. And this was based on a cardiovascular risk score, which took several risk factors into account, such as having diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, waist to hip ratio, among a few others. And we sort of put together this cardiovascular risk score based on things like the Framingham risk score, but worked with what we had in this cohort. And we'd also used this score previously in a previous study that we published. So we thought that it would be quite robust for that. Right, excellent. And your main outcomes measures, it looks like, so you're looking at all-cause dementia, the incidence of that, looking at executive function and how that changed over time. And you looked at neuroimaging, correct? That's right. I think it's important to say that our data was cross-sectional in nature, so we didn't get that change over time. But what we did do was look at a measure of executive function based on performance on several computer-based cognitive testing, and we looked at it across age. So I think that may be the figure that you're referring to. Very important to stress that it's absolutely cross-sectional, not longitudinal, but it just gives us an idea of what happens over time per se. And for the neuroimaging, what particular areas were you looking at? Were you looking at temporal lobe? I'm thinking of focal epilepsy, hippocampus, structures of that sort. Yeah, great question. And, and actually, the neuroimaging data in this cohort is incredibly rich. And what we did was a very sort of initial foray into the data for two reasons. Firstly, because we had such great results looking at the cognition and the dementia risks that we almost didn't want to sort of put too much in and sort of oversaturate the results. So what we did was we looked at a global brain measure, so total gray matter volume, and then hippocampal volume, which is specifically related to, as you said, temporal lobe epilepsy, but also it's a good marker used in dementia such as Alzheimer's disease. And we looked at white matter hyperintensity burden, as that is closely related to vascular risk factors. We are going to follow up this study with a more in-depth sort of whole brain analysis into the imaging of these conditions, which should be pretty exciting too. Nice. I can't help but wonder if you had this particular piece of data, individuals with focal epilepsy, there can be a particular finding called hippocampal sclerosis. Was that information that you had, was that a confounder that was thought about in terms of looking at this for risk factors for dementia development? So we didn't have data to identify people with hippocampal sclerosis. And I should just say hippocampal sclerosis is a common cause of developing temporal lobe epilepsy. And it's really a pathological diagnosis. So you need to look at the tissue of the hippocampus under the microscope, but you can get some evidence by looking at brain imaging. There could be some sort of changes in the gray matter, but this data set didn't have specific information on that and certainly not pathology results. Got it. Now, tell us about your results. What did you find? Yeah, so a couple of key findings. Firstly, after controlling for major confounds, especially age, 
we showed that individuals with focal epilepsy and stroke perform worse on a measure of executive function, so our measure that we looked at, compared to controls and individuals with migraine. And in fact, people who had epilepsy and stroke did similarly worse. What was maybe interesting to you was that people with a history of migraine performed pretty much the same as controls. And secondly, when looking at the risk of developing dementia during this follow-up period, now this was a little bit surprising based on our hypothesis, because individuals with epilepsy, we found about a four times increased risk of developing dementia, which is substantial. And what was interesting was that this risk was greater than what was seen with people who have had a stroke compared to healthy control. So individuals who had had a stroke had about a two and a half times increased risk of developing dementia compared to controls. And so worse with people with a history of focal epilepsy. I think that's fascinating. I mean, I'm thinking of just the juxtaposition between the two neurologic diseases. You have one where there's tissue damage that leads to decreased functioning, and then another where there's hyperactivity that essentially can lead to a dysfunction post ictally certainly, but then there's a return to function. So you would, I would think <laughs> that maybe the former would have a stronger correlation for dementia development as opposed to the latter. So I'm just like, what exactly is going on to the brain tissue? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And what I will just say is, you know, the usual caveats for a big population cross-sectional study should apply here. Right. We don't necessarily have the granularity that we would like to have when looking at sort of, you know, focal epilepsy subtypes, etc., stroke, exactly when they had their stroke. But, you know, it was a large cohort. We looked at, you know, several thousand individuals who had stroke and epilepsy. So we get a good idea of what's going on, a fairly good signal. And as to the question why, and that's really a thrust of my research ongoing. So, you know, whether epilepsy is related to some underlying tau process, as some of my previous work may have suggested, and also whether there's ongoing sort of interictal activity, which never manifests as overt seizures or may not manifest as overt seizures, but has some ongoing effect on cognition, I think are, you know, very interesting lines of thought when looking into epilepsy and cognition. And certainly what I'm also interested in is looking at whether this interictal type activity is a mechanism that's happening in people with other neurological conditions, such as Alzheimer's disease. And I think there is some evidence coming through suggesting that even people with Alzheimer's disease who do not have overt seizures may be having some interictal type epileptiform activity should you measure them closely enough or even do some intracranial recordings. So yeah, very fascinating and one of our main motivations for doing this study. Right. Now, when you throw in the cardiovascular risk factors, what happens? Yeah, so I think this is important partly by the magnitude of the results that we found. So as I said, we stratified the cohort into individuals with low, moderate, and high cardiovascular risk to get an idea of the impact of cardiovascular risk on developing dementia in these conditions. And in general, if you took individuals with a high cardiovascular risk compared to those with a low cardiovascular risk in this cohort, there was about a three-ish times increased risk of getting dementia, which is significant. And that's why it's such an important risk factor or set of risk factors to consider. But when you look at people who have epilepsy, so for example, if we take sort of one of the main results, individuals with epilepsy and a high cardiovascular risk were 13 times more likely to develop dementia compared to healthy controls with a low cardiovascular risk. And while that comparison is partly to emphasize the effect of cardiovascular risk and epilepsy, it just goes to show how important that is. And that's doubly important because currently we don't really have any clinical guidance to manage or mitigate risk of dementia in people with epilepsy. And that's something that's, you know, for me, I've really brought that to the clinic as something to look into in my patients. Yeah, that's certainly significant and something that we should be looking into and following. One question that I have about the potential confounders, you spoke about age, individuals with focal epilepsy, I'm assuming in this study, they are on medications. And many of these medications have impact on cognition. How is that accounted for in your study? 
I think this result, while in our supplementary material, is actually you know very interesting because, as you said, whenever there's a study of cognition in epilepsy, someone will always ask about medicines, and there is you know fairly good indication that various anti seizure medicines are known to have cognitive side effects. So, for example, topiramate, which, as you know, is also used in migraine sometimes. And there's been one pretty good study in older individuals with a new diagnosis of epilepsy showing that cognition is already worse before starting anti-seizure medicine. So that's sort of one hint that, you know, it's not just your medicines. However, in our study, what we did was we compared people who had a diagnosis of epilepsy and took anti-seizure medicines, whether they took one, two, or three anti-seizure medicines or more. And we compared that with people who did not have a diagnosis of epilepsy and also took anti-seizure medicines for some other reason. So for example, migraine or trigeminal neuralgia. And we looked at the effect on cognition. And what we found was that if you had epilepsy, taking higher numbers of anti-seizure medicines was associated with worse cognitive performance. Whereas if you did not have epilepsy, yes, you had a little bit of a cognitive hit, a cognitive impairment compared to controls, but it just wasn't as bad. So I think this is really interesting because what it tells us is that anti-seizure medications probably does have some effect of cognition, but actually what we're indexing by looking at number of anti-seizure medicines in people with epilepsy is probably their severity of epilepsy impacting cognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I just want to circle back to my comment on the neuroimaging hippocampal volume, white matter hyperintensities. What did you find in terms of that with dementia development? In terms of the neuroimaging, we really looked at it, as I said, in a very initial manner. And so we simply looked at these measures in people with epilepsy compared to controls without any of the conditions. And what we found was that people with epilepsy had a lower total gray matter volume, also a lower hippocampal volume, mm -hmm. and possibly a slightly higher white matter hypertensity burden. It wasn't statistically significant for white matter hypertensities, but it certainly trended that way. And the very sort of broad take-home message that we took was that despite having focal epilepsy, there is probably an effect on the whole of the brain, including hippocampus and other parts. And there could be various reasons for this, such as networks that are involved and other similar reasons. What does follow-up look like for this study? One follow-up is to take a closer dive into the neuroimaging, because I think, as I said, rich resource and we want to find out more on that. And secondly, for me, the follow-up is some other initiatives that I have going, trying to understand the mechanisms as to these results. You know, why is this the case? Is it due to interactive activity? Is it due to some proteinopathy type process? And so those are ongoing projects for my research and my research collaborations in my research group. And as well as that is just to take some of this and apply it clinically and just be very cognizant of cognitive difficulties in our patients with epilepsy and, of course, all the other conditions and see whether we can help with that by, you know, affecting these very targetable, modifiable risk factors. Right, exactly. Dr. Tai, thank you so much for this work by yourself and your colleagues. Oh, thanks for having me and hope you found it interesting. And, um, you know, I'd just like to say thank you to all of the people who worked with me on this project, certainly my supervisors and my collaborators, which really helped me with the analysis and understanding this topic. So yeah, thanks very much. I am Dr. Cynthia Armand, and I've been speaking with Dr. Zin Yu Tai about dementia risk and focal epilepsy. You can find the link to the paper in this episode's description. Thank you for listening to the podcast. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. The audio team also includes Mary Lynn Ferkeluk, Audrey Foreman, Lisa Hardin, Hannah Park, Shelley Steffens, and Dr. Linda Brubaker, Senior Editor, Multimedia. Thanks for listening.